Great to see you all today in a beautiful setting here in uh, Fort Myers, right next to Sanibel. And uh, there's a lot to talk about today, uh, given the election on Tuesday. And um, on the table, there are four charts I printed out, uh, two on federal government spending and taxes and the other on the national debt and interest. I'll get to those in a, in a few minutes. Um, there's also my business card is there. Uh, which has my Substack uh, address, uh, murraysaberin.substack.com, and uh, my contact information. So if you like what you hear, and uh, you need a speaker for your wedding, your bar mitzvah, your sweet 16, uh, just let me know. Okay, Rotary Club, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this past Monday, uh, I spoke at the International Men's Club in Naples, and um, I, I got a semi-standing ovation, so that was pretty good. Anyway, uh, elections. Elections, okay, people get excited about elections. Uh, one thing we know in California, they don't count very well because as of this morning, only 63% of the vote was counted. So I don't know what they're using in California. Maybe they're using cannabis to count, I don't know. But it is strange that a state like California with all the technology and all the so-called smart people there, they can't count the vote. As Joseph Stalin once remarked, it's not who votes that count, it's who counts the votes. So I think we're seeing that unfolding in some places in the United States. Anyway, um, just, a, just an overview of, the, of my impression of the race. The Democrats couldn't have picked a worse candidate than Kamala Harris. I mean, it's just incredible that um, given the fact that Joe Biden dropped out, but, but, which, by the way, I predicted in my Substack, you know, I think it was March or April of uh, 23. I said, he's not going to be the candidate. There was no way. I should have bet a lot of people who thought he was going to be. I would have made a lot of money. Anyway, I've been following presidential campaigns since 1960. And what I remember vividly in 1960 was when the first debate took place between uh, Pres uh, Vice President Nixon and uh, Senator Kennedy, John Kennedy, what impressed me as a 13-year-old is Nixon was incredibly nervous when he was introduced. Here was a, a polished politician, and he looked like he was running for a high school president, and he was incredibly nervous. Uh, the the um, uh, consensus was that Kennedy won the TV debate, but people who listened to the debate on radio said Nixon won the debate. And we know that President uh, John Kennedy was not very um, honest during the debate about the so-called missile gap between the United States and the Soviet Union. Anyway, uh, uh, let me confess, in 1968, I cast my first vote for president. Uh, at that time, you had to be 21 years old to vote, and this was just before my 22nd birthday. Needless to say, my candidate didn't win, uh, Hubert Humphrey, and that was the last time I voted for a Democratic candidate. Uh, I grew up in a Democratic household. My father was a blue-collar worker, and um, he told me he became a citizen in 1954, five years after we arrived in America, and in 1954, he became a citizen, and in 1956, Adlai Stevenson ran for the second time against uh, uh, President Eisenhower, and he donated $5 to Adlai Stevenson's campaign. That's comparable to about, I guess, uh, $70 today, given the, the inflation rate. Anyway, fast forward to 1971. Why in American history? Well, that's when President Nixon declared the United States government bankrupt because he severed the last link between the dollar and gold on August 15th, 1971, and imposed wage price controls. We were uh, traveling to Italy, I think a few days later, on the youth fair with Alitalia, had a big uh, full-page ad, I think, in the New York Times saying, if you're under 26, you can get the youth fair to Italy, $199. Sounds cheap today, but if you take that $199 in 1971, what it's worth today? Over $1,500. So although it was pretty cheap in 1971, today that would be a lot of money to travel to Europe for $1,500 round trip. Anyway, uh, bless the Italians, we, drove, we flew from Rome to Milan in a 747, and guess what? One of the engines malfunctioned on the ground, and we're in the plane for five hours. They didn't serve pizza, but they served everything they had on the plane to, in order to uh, satisfy the, uh, the passengers. 
Anyway, on the flight to New York City, 35,000 feet above the Atlantic, there was a passenger, I was walking down the aisle, passenger was reading the New York Times, and he was reading the op-ed page, and the article caught, the headline caught my attention. The President's Economic Betrayal, published September 4th, 1971. This is September 6th. We're flying back to September 6th. Who wrote the article? Murray N. Rothbard, who I knew briefly about. And I want to read to you the, the few sentences of the introduction. This is a phenomenal article. You can get it on the Mises website. Here it is right here, The President's Economic Betrayal. And it starts off. And we know the, fasc the word fascism has been used a lot during the presidential campaign. Here's what Rothbard starts his article with. On August 15th, 1971, fascism came to America and everyone cheered, hailing the fact that a strong president was once again at the helm. The word fascism is scarcely an exaggeration to describe the new economic policy. That was the name given to Nixon's uh, wage price controls. The trend has been there for years in the encroachment of big government over all aspects of the economy and society, in growing taxes, subsidies, and controls, and in the shift of economic decision-making from the free market to the federal government. So Rothbard in 1971, given everything that had happened since the New Deal, the Hoover New Deal, and then the Roosevelt New Deal, that this was the culmination of 30 years of bigger and bigger government in the United States. So when I read that article, I had registered as a Republican in 1969, and when you're a, Repub a Jewish Republican in the Bronx, you are very lonely, okay? <laughs> Lonelier than the Maytag repairman, okay? So, at that time, I left the Republican Party in 1971 because all Nixon's advisors were telling us how great, the free market advisors, free market economists are telling us how great wage price controls would be for the US economy going into the 72 election. And I said, these people are not serious. They're all wearing their Adam Smith ties and they're telling us that wage price controls are really good for the US economy. Well, the stock market took off and, um, and of course what happened later is uh, Arthur Burns, head of the Federal Reserve, goosed up the money supply and we got a stock market boom. And then, of course, we got the double-digit inflation of 73, 74. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. So I left the Republican Party because I realized they were not serious about free markets and limited government. That was attracted me to the Republican Party after learning that the, the New Deal, the Great Society programs were not going to work long term. They were going to give a, a, a short term shot to the American people. OK, uh, two months ago, I was on uh, Thomas Woods podcast talking about uh, this event and other issues. And Tom has a law saying no matter what president we get, we get John McCain's foreign policy of overseas interventionism and so on and so forth. And I said, Tom, we really have to amend your, your assertion that no matter who's president, we get F uh, FDR and LBJ's domestic policies. And what I'm going to do is prove that today with the data that we have at hand. So when you look at decades and decades of presidents of either party, what do you realize? And that's the chart that I have, the first chart that says government expenditures, okay, from the end of World War II to the present. And you can see it went from $40 billion, $50 billion a year at the end of World War, at the end of World War II. Remember, the federal government downsized its budget after uh, the war ended by 50%. And there were economists that warned this was going to cause a Great Depression because if government spending is withdrawn from the economy, the economy would what? Lose demand and the economy would suffer another Great Depression. That's why we got the 1946 Full Employment Act, which says it's the responsibility of the federal government to keep employment high and the economy humming. One of the great myths of all time. So look what happened. Uh, this chart doesn't do uh, justice to this, but spending under the Eisenhower administration was pretty mild. The budgets were balanced. And then in the 1960s, of course, we get the Great Society programs kicking in in the mid-60s, the Vietnam War, and spending starts ratcheting up and starts ratcheting up. And the point of this chart is it doesn't matter who's president. 
Republican or Democrat, spending keeps going up year after year after year. The irony is, and this is the real irony about politics and the economy, and I have a chart that shows that, that under Clinton, the last three years of the Clinton administration, the late 90s, with the Republican Congress, the budget was basically flat and we had a budget surplus. And the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, in 2000 projected, because of the flatlining of the federal budget, that we would have a $6.5 trillion budget surplus from 2000 to 2010. And I remember teaching a finance class at the time when we discussed this for some reason. And I said, if I were a betting man, I would bet that we were not going to have a $6.5 trillion budget from 2000 to 2010. Well, guess what? We had a $6.5 trillion deficit from 2000 to 2010 because we had the invasion of Iraq. We had all the other domestic spending and everything flipped under a Republican president for eight years under George W. Bush. And so you see this chart shows you the enormous expenditures that took place during 2008, 2009, 2010. That is the, um, that is the uh, uh, federal government addressing the housing crisis and spending spiked. And then the Republicans took control of uh, the Congress in 2000, uh, let's see, 2012 after Obamacare was passed. And what happened? The budget flatlined under a, a Democratic president with a Republican Congress. Do you see the pattern here? And then what happened? Spending started to increase and of course skyrocketing during COVID. So you have a Republican president in the White House during COVID and instead of allowing the free market, the medical profession to take care of COVID, we had lockdowns. Unemployment spiked to 16%. When you lock down the economy, you don't get any revenue. So what did the federal government do? It paid people for not working. Unemployment benefits went up, a whole host of be benefits went up, and spending spiked. And then it declined as COVID uh, lessened. And then a Biden came in and of course he started spending as well. And here we are today, the fiscal year just ended, $6.8 trillion of spending with nearly a $2 trillion deficit. Okay. So this tells us spending does increases no matter who's in the White House. The flip chart shows you the revenue of the federal government. We've gone from what, $40 billion a year at the end of World War II, to $5 trillion in, in revenue that the federal government has. And you can see the spike in revenue that took place um, uh, in 2018. I'm not quite sure why that occurred, but then of course you can see the big spike after uh, 2020. The point is revenue is based upon the health of the economy and the tax code. And the tax code, I don't have a chart for that, but the tax code has become a political football in America. Taxes go up, tax rates go up, tax rates go down. And uh, right now uh, we had a presidential candidate that wanted to increase tax rates, would have been very harmful for the US economy. So the question is, why does spending keep on going up? And here is the real key that no one in Washington is talking about. And I've been on radio and TV for the past couple of years talking about this issue. We have a financial constitutional crisis in America, okay? And how do we know that? Well, we go to the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 authorizes the federal government to spend money on A, B, C, and D. There's no authorization for Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid, two of the biggest components of the federal budget. And I have to tell the truth about these th three programs. We know Medicaid is a welfare program. That's clear. If you qualify it based upon income, you get government uh, medical care or government paid medical care, which should be what? Taxpayer paid medical care. We should never use the word government pays for anything. Government is a middleman between the taxpayer and the tax recipient. So we should use our language correctly. Now let's talk about the two third rails of the American economy or politics, Social Security and Medicare, okay? Most people think that it's a program they pay for like a 401k, not true. Your 401k, you put your money in, 
You invest it according to your, the way you see fit, and it's yours. It's your property. You own it. You don't own Social Security. You don't own Medicare. These are basically welfare programs for senior citizens. No one is saying this. So that means Warren Buffett, who's worth $100 billion, is being subsidized by the workers at the Marriott, who are making, what, $15, $20 an hour. So what is the justification now? What is the moral justification for that? There isn't. And we keep on uh, having the myth that this program it is untouchable. Well, Buffett says he's what? Undertaxed. He's constantly saying he's undertaxed. Okay, I don't think he's voluntarily sent in a check to the Treasury. <laughs> but if he really wants to do something great for America, and Bill Gates also, and Michael Bloomberg, and the Clintons, and the Obamas, and all the other people that say, we don't have enough revenue. Well, if you gut off the Medicare and, and Social Security roles, there'll be more money for people who are in a lesser economic means. So we have to tell the truth about Social Security and Medicare, and I'm currently working on an article to really transform this whole process. But anyway, this is the constitutional crisis that none, no one in both parties wants to address because it's political suicide. That's why politics, and Mark and I are, have an experience running in the political process. If you tell the truth, you get badgered by the media, that you just do, okay? Uh, for example, in 1997, when I was the Libertarian Party candidate for governor in New Jersey, and we were the first third party candidate to raise enough funds, which uh, gave us a match from the state, which then required me to be in the debates with the two major party candidates, I was advocating for medical marijuana in 1997, and people thought the end of the world was gonna happen. It is now so mainstream in the United States is there anyone opposed to medical marijuana in the United States today? I don't think so, okay? So th this is the point I'm making, is that over time, culture changes, values change, ideology changes. And this is where we're in now. So we're seeing a process unfold in the United States which has dire consequences, which is the next two charts. Those next two charts reveal the staggering pace of new debt, again, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, we've added $11 trillion of debt. Okay. What does that portend, given that the interest on the national debt will soon be the largest component of the federal budget? The scenario that is possible, I'm not predicting this, the scenario that's possible, which we've seen in Weimar Germany in, in the 1920s, which led to the collapse of the German economy and the rise of Hitler 10 years later. We've seen this in Argentina for the past, what, 60 years. We saw it in Zimbabwe, right, where they were printing up trillion dollar notes. I mean, you've had hyperinflation throughout the world because central banks go wild in printing up money because the federal government or the national government doesn't have enough tax revenue to pay for all its expenses. So there are two ways you can, well, actually three ways. You can raise taxes, which of course leads to tax revolts. You can issue debt, which is scooped up by individual citizens and businesses, which means there's less money available for the private capital markets. Or, you could, or the federal bank or the central bank can, what, buy up the debt, that's called monetizing the debt, and we're off to the races. That is a real possibility in a few years in America if the federal budget is not under control. And given what um, President-elect Trump wants to do by cutting taxes, I mean, everyone should be in favor of cutting taxes, uh, tax rates, but he's really uh, gone really no, ticks, uh, no tax on tips, no tax on Social Security benefits, um, and, and the list goes on and on. But the point is, he's, if he asks Elon Musk to cut $2 trillion out of the budget, out of a $7 trillion budget, that would be heroic. That would be comparable to what happened after World War I with uh, President Harding. They cut the budget after World War II. But the problem today is, and I have a chart that shows this, is that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are about $3.5 trillion. And you have the defense budget of nearly $900 billion. You have interest on the debt of a trillion dollars. So there isn't much wiggle room unless you go after the big stuff, which is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the military budget, which of course um, 
as you know, or maybe you don't know, the U.S. military budget is, I think, greater than the next seven countries or eight countries combined. Okay? I mean, we have troops all over the world. We have bases all over the world. This is a place for real cutting if you believe in what? America first. If you believe in America first, you protect your border, you protect your country, and uh, you don't try to what? As John Adams famously said, you don't go overseas to try to fight monsters. Okay. Now, there's another tax that's very important that I think tr Trump will do a good job. That is regulation. Regulation is a tax. If you're a small business owner or even a, a medium-sized company, uh, you have enormous amount of regulations, city, state, county, and federal government regulations. This is a burden that takes money out of the pockets of entrepreneurs, corporations, shareholders, and gives it to the federal government in a sense. So if Trump could do a real good job on regulation, that would be, I think, a signature issue for him to, to um, do in his next uh, uh, administration. And who got the deregulation ball rolling in the United States? Republicans will not acknowledge this, but former Senator Phil Graham, former economics professor, had a wonderful op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on Jimmy Carter's 100th birthday. Jimmy Carter got deregulation rolling in the late 70s. And he hired an economist, Alfred Kahn from Cornell, I believe it was, who, who looked at the U.S. regulations and said, these things are a horror show. That's why we've had stagflation for the whole decade. And he started deregulating. Reagan continued some of it. So the boom that we've experienced in the 80s and the 90s can be traced to Jimmy Carter's deregulation. And you've got to give him credit for that. And unfortunately, given the partisan nature of our politics, which of course by definition is partisan, tell the truth about Jimmy Carter's administration regarding deregulation. It was one of the most important events of the, what, post-war period. Okay. The next thing that really concerns me is Trump's position on trade. And for someone who has business interests around the world, I just don't get it. Well, we know why, why he does it. He believes, so do the Democrats, that it's the responsibility of the federal government to project, protect jobs in America. It's not here. That's not a responsibility of the federal government. And the other myth that Rothbard has written about, Mises has written about, I think Tom has written about it also, Tom DiLorenzo, the trade deficit. The trade deficit is a non-issue. And I can give you a simple example of that. When Trump says China is ripping us off, I have no idea what he means. What does he mean by China is ripping us off? They're selling us products that the American people are buying. There's a seller and a buyer in a voluntary exchange. The fact that China may be subsidizing their producers means that the Chinese consumers are getting ripped off by the Chinese government. Let me give you an example of why trade deficits are totally irrelevant. If you go to the supermarket every week, and let's say you spend $100 at Publix, right? There are Publix all over Florida and the Southeast. You spend $100 a week. That means in a year, you're spending $5,000 at Publix, right? You're voluntarily giving them $5,000 to get goods that you buy at Publix. How much does Publix buy from you? Nada. You're running a $5,000 tra trade deficit with Publix every year. Does anybody lose sleep over the fact that you're spending more at Publix and they're not buying anything from you? Would they be is that called ripping you off? No, of course not. So the whole notion of a trade deficit between countries is totally irrelevant because we don't have, I mean, Florida, people in Florida buy stuff from what? Texas and Montana and whatever. And we probably run a trade deficit with them on certain items. They buy a lot of oranges from us or what other agricultural products. The whole concept of a trade deficit is it belies free market economics. And so what makes this all possible? Okay. And that's the chart I didn't provide you, which is the Federal Reserve's money printing, which is breathtaking. The Federal Reserve during the uh, Financial crisis, 
had about $800 billion of assets on its balance sheet, it went to $2 trillion. So they more than doubled the amount of assets on their balance sheet. And then it kept on going up and up and up. Then 2020, the Federal Reserve had $4 trillion of assets on their balance sheet. And during COVID, it went to $9 trillion. And the people at the Fed, people on, on, on some pe most people on TV, why do we have inflation? Well, if you print $9 trillion, and that money is in the banking system that then spreads through the economy, it's gonna raise prices, okay? Here in Southwest Florida, we know what happened to housing prices the last five years. They've doubled, some places they've tripled. So you don't have to have a PhD in economics, you just need a PhD in common sense that if you print money, you're going to have massive inflation. Now the money supply has been, um, uh, went down and now it's increasing again. So we are probably going to see inflation decelerate for the next few months, then probably accelerate over the next several years. So the money printing by the Fed, and there's a great quote I have from a wonderful uh, money manager who wrote a book called Greenspan's Bubbles, The Age of Ignorance in the Federal Reserve. This is William Fleckenstein based in Seattle. He says, central bankers are actually central planners. They pick an interest rate to which, to within two decimal places, they guess is the right one, and then they proceed to cram it down the throat of the banking system. And on Thursday, Chairman Powell announced the Fed is gonna drop interest rates again. Well, they don't have a magic wand to drop interest rates, okay? They don't say, okay, interest rates are gonna go down. They pump money into, money into the banking system. That lowers, that increases the supply and therefore you lower the price. Here's the interesting thing about interest rates. And when I first started learning about this in the 70s, I said, there's a real disconnect here because prices in the marketplace are determined by supply and demand, economics 101. Interest rates, mortgage rates, long-term bonds, corporate bonds are determined by supply and demand. Why are short-term rates manipulated by the Federal Reserve? No one's asking that question. No one's asking a simple question. Why should the Fed manipulate short-term rates? For a very simple reason. They think they have to, quote, stimulate the economy by keeping rates low and, and don't allow the free market to determine rates. So um, if Donald is listening or someone has Donald's ear, he should call up uh, Tom DiLorenzo. The Wall uh, Mises Institute had that great ad in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was it June, July? Full page ad, do we need the Fed? And the answer is a resounding no, okay? So um, Tom, I wouldn't hold your breath to get a call from uh, Mar-a-Lago, but uh, it should be very interesting. Anyway, the last thing I wanna talk about is something that's really interesting. The financial markets, the stock market particularly. And I came across these two charts because people wanna know, is the stock market gonna crash because um, if, if Harris, one, is the stock market going to crash because Trump won? Well, guess what, folks? According to one chart I have here, how markets react when the president and Congress represent the same political party? Stock market keeps on going up. So under George W. Bush, the market went up when the Republicans controlled the Congress. When Barack Obama was, in, was president and yet the Democrats controlling problems, the market went up over a one year, three year and five year time period. Fascinating, fascinating. We know what causes stock prices to go up, the discount of future earnings and of course the Federal Reserve's money printing which increases asset values throughout the economy. So when I saw this chart, I said, people who agonize over one candidate or another winning does not make any sense. What happens when you have a president and different political parties? Same thing, stock market goes up, except with, for a few exceptions, which was 73, 75 on the Gerald Ford when you had the stagflation and the oil price crisis of 73, 75. Um, and then George W. Bush in 2001, 2003, that was the dot-com bubble bursting, stock market went down. But otherwise the market goes up, up, up and away. Okay, so again, the evidence is quite clear. It, does, it really doesn't matter who's in the White House long-term because prices will continue to go up, the stock market will continue to go up, spending will continue to go up, and they'll be using the, um, the tax code to manipulate interest rates. The main thing that um, needs to be done is the Fed has to stop inflating, stop manipulating interest rates. Deregulation has to occur to free up resources 
for entrepreneurs to do what they do best, provide us with goods and services that they want. And, um, and then we enjoy what we have, uh, the Florida sunshine, the, uh, all the amenities in Florida and other parts of the country. But in the meantime, people are agonizing of, uh, of who wins the election. I gave that up a long time ago about who's going to win the election. Um, this way you, have, you don't have, won't have any sleepless nights. You'll just enjoy what you have, and uh, you'll be able to uh, help your tri children, help your grandchildren, and just improve um, life in your, in your uh, own community and in your own uh, neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.